my name is Jay and welcome to the channel and welcome back to Sanikov land. In the last episode we completed most of the entrance structure including the gift shop and the big uh, kind of green feature just outside of the entrance. And today we're going to take our first venture into the park itself. So we're just going to go right in and start off with our first animal habitat today which features the capuchin monkey. We're also going to be working on the entrance plaza itself, a few little shops and a few decorations to make it look really nice. And we're going to kind of set up the path work a little bit and kind of start getting a feel for what the zoo is going to look like once it's fully fledged. So, so let's start off nice and early by putting in the path work for where this habitat is going to sit. So what I did was I raised the path very slightly and I used a different type of path. So I used the uh, herringbone path to kind of set up where guests will be able to view this habitat from. And one thing I'm learning very early on from this, um, this park build is that using multiple different path types really helps add to the realism of this place. Um, back in my old park build, Boomy Reptile Sanctuary and um, my other one as well, Alisund Arctic Wildlife Park, one of the main issues I faced was I realized everything started to look very samey, very bland. And I realized that from above, Having different coloured paths and different heights of paths and stuff like that all really adds the visual interest of a place and makes it look so much more realistic. So what I've started off in this park doing is that I've included this herringbone path just along the right and guess that it's at a very slight elevation, almost um, imperceptible. You wouldn't think about it if you're just looking at it, but I think it just adds so much more to the realism of it and um, I just really like how it looks as well. The habitat itself is for the capuchin monkey, which I think right now is the smallest animal in the game, if I'm not mistaken. It might not be, it might be like the peepal or something, but I'm not 100% sure. And the capuchin monkey is so adorable and I love it. It is beautiful, it is really nice to have a more generic monkey type. I think the only other two non-ape primates that we have are the Japanese macaque and the, um, the mandrel. Oh, and of course the, the two lemur species. But we don't have a kind of traditional monkey type monkey, <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. And I, I do think they are they are really cute, they're super lovely. And today we're going to start using our species profile format. So in fact, let's just get onto that right now and we'll continue talking about the build right after it. So on screen right now, we have the species profile for the Colombian white face capuchin monkey. These guys are so adorable and they're super interesting as animals. First off, we got their scientific name which is Cebus Capuchinus. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I'll go with it. As far as the IUCN status goes, they are least concerned, which is really nice to know that they're not endangered. They have a sister species which is a little bit more vulnerable, but as far as this particular species goes, they are pretty okay. As far as size goes, males are a little bit larger, they get up to 4 kilograms and 50 centimeters long, so about half a meter. And females are just slightly smaller than that, so they get to about 3 kilograms and maybe like 40 centimeters. The habitat in the wild consists of rainforest, deciduous forests, and mangroves. A lot of kind of wet, uh, mix of wet and dry environments, but generally more humid, wet climates. And they kind of stretch all the way across Central, Amer uh, Central America and the northern, uh, the northern section of South America. As far as their lifespan in the wild goes, they live for about 30 to 45 years, but in captivity they've been seen living all the way up to 55 years, which is really impressive and it is one of those animals where it is very nice to know that they do live longer in captivity because they are getting better care, they're less exposed to predators, and um, they just get a better, you know, quality of life. The, as far as their diet goes in the wild, they do eat a variety of things, mainly fruits, leaves and insects, so, you know, things that a small monkey would very easily find in the rainforest. Now let's go to some interesting facts about the Colombian white-faced capuchin. These guys, in fact all capuchins, are generally considered to be the most intelligent of the New World primates, so uh, if you don't know the dis uh, distinction between the New World and the Old World, Old world species are species generally thought to come from Africa, Asia, Oceania, uh, Europe, so that side of the world, and new world animals uh, come from North and South America. So as far as capuchins go, 
the fact that they are so intelligent has been proven many times just because they unfortunately have been used in many experiments in the past and people very quickly realize that these guys are pretty darn smart. They do have a degree of self-awareness. They are very, very capable of using tools. It's, it's very fascinating stuff. And in fact, they have a lot of very interesting learned behaviors. Not specific to this Colombian white-faced capuchin species, but to capuchins as a whole. In fact, there is a species of capuchin, I believe it's called the tufted capuchin, which exhibits an incredibly interesting behavior where they find a species of millipede that is that secretes toxins. And what they do is they smash up the millipede in their hands, get the toxins, and rub them on themselves to kind of act as an insect repellent, which is incredibly fascinating that they know how to do that and they teach that to um, their offspring. Of course, it's not a matter of like, oh, we know this is toxic, so we do this. It's more of a learned behavior, but it is fascinating nonetheless. Back to the Colombian white-faced capuchin. These guys do live in pretty large troops of, um, and they're mixed, mixed sex troops, so you have multiple males and multiple females. And their troops are led by an alpha male and an alpha female. In the wild, their predators include things like caimans, which are crocodilians, harpy eagles, which are huge birds of prey, and of course a variety of constrictor species like um, boas and anacondas. And interestingly enough, when threatened, the entire troop of capuchins will either make the decision to flee or they will mob the predator. So they might come together in a big group and like start yelling and throwing things and essentially try their best to scare off whatever is attacking a member of their family, which is really nice to know. That's a pretty cool behavior, I think. These guys are really, really interesting and I do hope you've enjoyed that. That was our first species profile of Sanakov land. We're gonna have this for every animal that we introduce into the park. So any species at all, we, were gonna, we are gonna be learning a little bit more about them and their behavior and their life in captivity, life in the wild. And I think it'll be really fun because it is really nice to learn about animals together and I think it is a very interesting kind of topic that we can just chat about and discuss and, you know, just have a little bit of fun with. Now that we've covered the animal itself, let's talk about how we're housing the animal here in game. So now we're going back to discussion about the building system and how we're working on the park itself. Um, that's just kind of how the format is going to be for these videos, I think. I do hope you like it, of course, as usual, please do leave me some feedback. Whether you like having the species profiles where they are, or whether you like it maybe right at the start of the video or later on. This is the first episode where we are trying this new format, so I'm very open to feedback. But yeah, let's get back into how we're housing the capuchins. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to have a semi-enclosed habitat where there's going to be part of the habitat which is enclosed, which is a resting area for these animals where they can come in and have a sleep and that's going to have some uh, on the outside of that enclosed area you're going to have an enclosed guest viewing area so the guests can view these animals resting without disturbing them so the outside is also going to be enclosed so that sunlight can't get in and they're going to have a very peaceful sleeping area as well with this habitat i've ended up going for a size of about 800 meters square total for eight capuchins Interestingly enough, I didn't know this while I was building, but I found out that in the wild, a troop of capuchin monkeys will actually occupy a space of about 800 meters squared in the rainforest. So I thought that would be really cool and um, good fortune there for these guys because now in this park they have that equivalent space. So I think that's pretty cool. So they do have a decent amount of space to work with. And I wanted this habitat to be very naturalistic. So what I've done is I've included a rock wall at the back of the habitat to give them stuff to climb on. There are flat rock perches where they can sit on and hop from one place to another. And at the bottom I've included a small pond as well which they can drink from. But I kept it very shallow because as far as I'm aware Caputins are not the best swimmers. So it is a very shallow pool of water that, you know, to prevent any chance of drowning or anything like that. And they do use this pond to drink a lot which I quite like. I like watching the drinking behavior. I might have some of that in the cinematics as well, I'm not sure, but you keep an eye out if I do. And of course, because they are primates and they need a lot of climbing space, I made sure to include a ton of climbing structures, mainly using the new bamboo pieces from the pack that these guys came in. So we've got loads of bamboo, 
And I love using the rope coils as well to kind of surround the bamboo and make it look like it's being held together well. We also have a lot of rope that these guys can climb on because as of the new update, ropes are now climbable by animals, which is great. And especially by these guys, because they are really small, they can just kind of climb wherever they want and it's great. And speaking of climbing, I ran into a bit of a problem here. One of the things I struggled with most was how to make this look like the animals can't escape. I experimented a lot with different types of roofs and like maybe glass roofs and things like that but nothing really looked very realistic or very good. So eventually I settled with no roof but I added in this border around the exterior part of the habitat. On the top of the fence there's a little piece of roofing that goes inwards and in my head cannon, I would imagine that would either have like a hot wire or, or rollers or something that would prevent them from climbing it. So that was my solution at the end. Obviously what I would ideally have is mesh netting on the top. So I do hope that gets added in the future because I think that is kind of a staple in zoos for a lot of animals. For example, big cats that can climb well. Um, primates of course, they do have a lot of habitats where they have this mesh netting over top. And that just kind of prevents the animals from escaping of course. And I think that would be a great addition to the game. The only issue is I can't see how they would implement it in a good way because obviously mesh netting kind of falls and it's a it's a kind of a fabric -y material, it's not exactly rigid and sturdy so I don't know how they would necessarily implement it but I think um, it is eventually going to be something that we get whether it be in a future pack or a free update, I'm not sure but I think it would be very cool to have eventually. Back to climbing, now these monkeys actually have a lot of really cool climbing behaviours because I've been watching them for a while and I did try to get a bunch of it on camera. I think Frontier have probably, not sure whether they've uh, increased the efficiency of it or increased the amount that these animals climb, but they are spending most of their time off the ground, which I really like because that's kind of very realistic for animals like this. They spend most of their time in the trees and specifically with these capuchin monkeys, that I think they just look so good in the trees climbing about. Um, speaking of which, I didn't actually add any trees in this habitat, I might have added like one or two. But that's because almost all the trees are too tall, they very much uh, protrude out of the habitat and give them a very easy way to escape. So I didn't include any trees but I did include like I said a lot of climbing structures and I do include a lot of foliage, a lot of low lying foliage. Once again making use of the incredible variety of foliage that we have been given with this new South America DLC. In fact. We've got some, <laughs> I, do, I just, like I've said so many good things about it already, but the new foliage works so well because a lot of it, um, a lot of it is like creeping plants, so like flowers and like roots and stuff that would grow out of rocks. So even this back rock wall I could make look really interesting by having these bromeliad plants growing out of the cracks, having the quarter line kind of just weave its way through. I think it looks really good. And of course, uh, let's talk about the interior section where these guys go to rest. So for that, I wanted to make it look quite different. Of course it is dark because it's on the inside, but I wanted it to be like, so that, uh, how do I describe this? I wanted it to look like these animals are getting the utmost privacy and like, you know, a very comfortable place to sleep. So what I did was I included loads of different platforms, a lot of different nest boxes, there's bedding everywhere made it look as comfortable as possible, again with more climbing structures on the inside. And uh, guests can view all these from the outside and I've included the one-way glass. I'm not sure how realistic that is, but I think it is possible to set up one-way glass in this kind of situation because if you keep the exterior where the guests view it completely um, dark, I think it could work, but obviously I'm not 100% sure. And chances are you'll want to see them through regular glass anyways. But aside from that, I think it worked out really nice. In fact, they used the sleeping area like to kind of huddle up, like all eight capuchins kind of huddle up together in one nest box and they all sleep there together. And it is so cute. You'll see some cinematics of that at the end as well. I managed to catch that and it was adorable. And I really like the nest boxes. All Basically what I did for those is I just took the East Asia timber pieces and what I did with them is just make them into a box. And because these guys are so small, they can use them very easily, so I just filled them with bedding and made sure they could get to them via like a little bamboo pieces or whatever. And they love them, they, they sleep in there all the time, so I'm really happy with that. 
And halfway through this, I realized a huge issue I had which I didn't tackle early on and that was a bit of my downfall. The zookeepers can't actually get into the habitat. They can get in but they can't like walk through it because it's so full of clutter and it's made for a climbing animal and not a person. So what I had to do was I had to eventually clear out a path for the keepers so they can go straight to the habitat and clean it up and give food and stuff like that. But oh my god, when I realized that I was like, oh god, am I going to need to take this whole thing apart? Thankfully I didn't have to, I just had to make that path. But uh, yeah, that was a bit of a bit of a struggle. So you might see uh, some big changes happen off, off screen. <laughs> but yeah, eventually the keepers can go in. I added in a bunch of enrichment for these animals. So we have the foraging pit, mm, a suspended forager, you know, the usual food, um, food platforms and some of the like bamboo skewer things where they stick the fruit on and the animals eat from it. And of course you'll see footage of them eating from some of these at the end of the video as well in the cinematics. And they look super cute while doing it because they're adorable. They like so cute. But uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the building aesthetic and what I've started building up here. You may notice that I'm using a lot of bamboo pieces and I'm also using loads of plaster pieces. The plaster pieces have come in so handy. Uh, doing this whole build so far because they are very really colorable and their texture is pretty nice so they work really well with almost any building material and I've used them a lot for these uh, these habitats here also I forgot actually I've added on a little staff section to the back of this habitat uh, inside there there's just a keeper hut and uh, the animal trade center but uh, I just made it look like okay so this is where the keeper prepared food and all that and like I said I wanted it to be realistic so I imagine that's also where they can take the capuchins in if they're cleaning the habitat, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, going back to the uh, aesthetics of the building, well, like I said, using loads of plaster. As far as roofing materials go, I started using the palm thatch as well for the guest viewing area and I think it looks really nice. And uh, for the entrance plaza, yeah let's talk about that actually. The entrance plaza I got to work on in this episode as well. And what I did was I built the entire shop section off the um, main area. I built it somewhere else and I moved it into place. So what I did for that is again, used a lot of plaster pieces for the walls, um, used Ricey's amazing fonts to just put on some words on there for, you know, to describe Sanikov land. And maybe I might add on some stuff that says like, oh, get coffee here or whatever, stuff like that. Anyways, I used um, the slate roofing for that. And that's another thing, and it's just like I said um, about using different parts to create visual interest, I also find that using different roofing material and different walls and stuff like that, it's just, it makes it feel so much more real because no zoo or, you know, no building is going to be purely homogenous. Like, you're not going to walk to an entire zoo where every single building is made out of the same material or the same color, you know? And that thing was the downfall of my previous parks. They were way too homogenous in that way. And I think with Santa Claus Land, we've already grown past that so much and I love it. <laughs> and now back to the entrance plaza. We're using a lot of benches in that same pale green color, which is kind of becoming iconic of Santa Claus Land. I think I really like it. It's kind of the color of faded bamboo, so I really like it. And we are using those benches uh, all over the place now. So those are going to be the kind of signature benches for Santa Claus Land, the pale green uh, classic benches, I think. And of course, I moved the I moved the shops into place in that central area, and they've got a little uh, trim around the bottom as well, which I made using the plaster pieces. So I think they look pretty realistic. They look like a shop that you uh, realistically see near an entrance plaza. And I also added some picnic tables with some umbrellas. Again, making use of that color scheme, and I think those are going to be our two main colors. I'm not sure if you're seeing it on screen right now or not, but um, the umbrellas. Some of them are the pale green, like I said. And the others are this uh, really nice kind of uh, warm yellow, which I really love. I think those two colors work so well together. And I think those are going to be the two colors we use most in Sanikov Land. And uh, talking about the plaster pieces again, actually, sorry, I'm hopping all over the place, but talking about the plaster pieces, they are really good for filling in gaps. So but by gaps, I mean like when you use paths next to each other and stuff, they always leave a little bit of a seam where you can see the ground and stuff like that. And essentially what you can do is just make tiny plaster structures to co cover them up. And I think it works out really well. You'll see them later on or you might have already seen them on screen. But just using those plaster pieces to seal gaps makes it look so much more realistic. And uh, you can even hide benches under them to make it so that guests will sit on them. Like they would be like, you know, some of those concrete blocks that people use as benches, stuff like that. 
And if I'm not filling up gaps with plaster pieces, the alternative would be me using the mulch to fill them in and then fencing it off and then putting in a bunch of foliage, which I also do a lot. Today we're introducing some new plants. We're introducing our first palms. So we're using some acai plants, uh, acai palms, and they are, I didn't know they were pronounced that way. I thought they were acai palms, but yeah. Anyways, the, the acai palms uh, use two of them and they're just kind of hanging out, two or three of them. They're just kind of hanging out near the entrance plaza. I also end up using these big uh, pillar-like things. It's just a bit of decoration. I think they've, uh, they're from the African theme. Uh, not sure what they're called in-game. They're meant to be signs, like there should be words on them, but I think they just look really nice as a little bit of decoration. So I just plop them in place and they fit in really well, I think. And yeah, that is pretty much it for the entrance plaza. I just, uh, like I said, I did a bit of path work to kind of make it have a much, uh, bit of a nicer shape because obviously the path work is tricky because of the path system, which uh, I'm sure you've heard many a person talk about if they play Planet Zoo on YouTube. But yeah, I managed to get it looking pretty nice. And I, in fact, I decided to separate the path, the main entrance path, away from the path that leads outside the uh, gift shop. So that that path, the gift shop path, will actually be an exit path purely. So that people don't enter via that, but they will leave via that. Obviously, don't know whether it will work in, in the game. And actually speaking of that as well, I, you might realize that I'm not opening the park. Like, I'm not letting guests in. And I might not open it until the very end because guests, having guests, especially big crowds of guests, is going to tank my framework. It is going to absolutely destroy it. So <laughs> let's leave that for later. And I know I might test it between episodes, see if it works, but uh, yeah, because let's leave it for now. Because of how piece heavy and how detail heavy this zoo is going to be, I do want to try and minimize anything that's going to cause unnecessary frame drops. So that's probably why we won't see any guests for a while. But you know, now that pretty much covers everything I've done in this episode. Uh, right now, as of uh, me recording the voiceover, I've actually done a bit more work in the park. Nothing I filmed, but I started to do more work on the outside because there is a lot of stuff that needs to be done on the outside of the park. For example, we have a second subway entrance to build. We have a bus stop, which I've just built actually. You'll be able to see it in the next episode. And uh, just to, you know, neaten up the parking area, add in a bit more foliage, that sort of thing. So that's a lot of stuff I'll do off screen and you'll be able to see it on the cinematics for my regular build in my regular episodes. Which will be, uh, like I said, probably once every three or four days. And the next one will like, I'm not really sure what animal we're going to focus on yet. I've got a bunch of good suggestions from people. Uh, one of them being to have an indoor jaguar habitat. We're definitely going to do that. It's more a matter of whether we'll do that next or not. So, my currently my two options are, like, do I keep the zoo sectioned off to continents? So, like, for example, we could have a South America section, and then an Africa section, etc., etc. Or, do we keep it sectioned off by a type of animal? So, primates, big cats. So, I'm not 100% sure which one I prefer. That's kind of the two ways zoos usually do it. So, I'll, I'll think about it a little bit, but. Like I said before, I when it comes to zoo building, I just kind of go with what inspires me and what I feel makes sense at the time, so I probably won't make the decision until I'm actually building. But uh, I'm leaning more right now in terms into the uh, primate idea, so like for example, now that we've done the capuchin, we can start working our way into like a full-on primate section towards the right of the park. And uh, of course, one more thing we need to be building is the backstage stuff, so we need to be building our staff area. Right now, all the staff buildings, besides the ones I talked about earlier, like the vet, the quarantine, all that is just kind of shoehorned on like one end of the park, hidden away from the camera, so you can't see it while I'm building. They're just kind of sitting there, there's like no path connection or anything, it's just so I got rid of that annoying notification that kept saying, oh you don't have a quarantine, no 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 But yeah, that's, uh, that's why you don't see the notification, and we're gonna have to do something about that later. You may have noticed that I've started uh, working on the zoo's exterior wall. So that's right behind the Kabuchins at the moment and it just separates the zoo itself from the main road. So we're going to start working more on that wall as well and just kind of wind it around in a way that makes sense. Because uh, of course you don't want people on the outside just being able to waltz into the zoo and you know steal a capuchin or something. So of course we are going to need to work on that exterior wall as we go along as well. And we're going to start working a bit more on the uh, the road system for the staff as well because 
as guests go on the path, um, staff are going to be able to drive around the back of the habitat via the, one of the roads that lead to from the roundabout. So we're going to work on that as well. So yeah, that, that's pretty much it for this episode. That's all we're going to be doing in the next episode. Once again, please, please, please do leave a comment suggesting animals or builds that you want to see. Like I said, I do reply to all the comments and last episode we got some really great comments that I was very happy to hear and thanks to everyone who did comment the last episode, thanks to everyone who liked it. And for this one as well, please do um, like the video if you enjoyed the content, please do comment like I said before. And if you want to see more of this stuff or you want to see more of Sanikov land and you want to see uh, more Planet Zoo content in general. I might be making another tutorial at some point soon uh, and of course I might be hopping back into Ali Soon Wildlife Park in the next month or so for season 2 of that park so you know you can look out for that as well. But yeah with all that out of the way thanks so much for watching it's been really nice having you along for this ride and uh, as always I will see you in the next one. Bye guys!